Hi, everybody, uh, and thank you for joining us for this webinar. Uh, I'm Caitlin, and I'm the Program Director for B City Canada. And we're joined today by uh, Genevieve Rowe, the lead biologist for the Native Pollinator Initiative. Uh, and she works for Wildlife Preservation Canada. Uh, and I'll just let her take it away in a minute. Um, at the end, we're gonna do some questions. Uh, if you have any questions, just write them in the chat box below and Genevieve will answer them. All right, do you wanna take it away? Sure. All right, thank you, Caitlin, first and foremost, for the invitation to participate in this webinar series, and also for the quick introduction. I'm gonna to try to keep this presentation as brief as possible, um, but I am happy to be here because I think that initiatives like these uh, webinar series go a long way in getting the right people and the right organizations connected, and that goes a long way in the end in supporting each other's research programs all across the country. So without further ado, I'm here today to introduce everyone to Wildlife Preservation Canada's Bumblebee Recovery Program, which as I'll get more into is part of our Native Pollinator Initiative and is part of the Pollinator Recovery and Conservation Programs that I am currently managing as lead biologist for the organization for their Native Pollinator Initiative. So the talk today is gonna to have to stay pretty introductory because there just isn't enough time to go into detail about everything we're working on. And there's certainly not enough time to get into any nitty gritty results for each of the components of our research. Um, so I'll start with a brief introduction to Wildlife Preservation Canada and to its Native Pollinator Initiative specifically. Then I'll move right into our Bumblebee Recovery Program, which is organized into four primary research avenues. So Wildlife Preservation Canada is a nationwide nonprofit conservation organization that focuses on hands-on interventions for critically endangered species. So those are species where habitat protection is not enough to save them from extinction and they need direct interventions. As an organization, we manage research and recovery programs for a variety of taxa, but the focus of all of our programs is pretty consistent, and that is that each prioritizes the development and the implementation of scientifically based conservation techniques. So those end up being things like conservation breeding programs, translocations, and reintroductions. We run major recovery programs for the Eastern Loggerhead Shrike, which is a really neat predatory songbird. And those projects work closely, closely with a lot of partners in the US. We're also at the forefront of managing research and recovery initiatives for the last known population of the Massasauga rattlesnake in the Ojibwe Prairie system of Southern Ontario, which is down near Windsor. And then out in British Columbia, we have major breeding programs running for the Western Western Painted Turtle and the Oregon Spotted Frog. And these breeding programs have been successfully augmenting wild populations of both of these species now for a number of years. And then of course, my favorite, we have our pollinators and our two big guys that fall under the Native Pollinator Initiative are our breeding program for the Taylor's Checker Spot Butterfly, which in Canada is isolated to the west coast of British Columbia. And then we have a couple bumblebee species across the country. As the name suggests, our Native Pollinator Initiative includes programs that specifically aim to preserve and protect Canada's native pollinators. It's a nationwide initiative that has established itself as a leader in the field of pollinator recovery, and we're always looking to expand our efforts and our collaborations both in Canada and internationally. internationally. At the national level, we have um, a wildflower seed program where we promote the creation of large-scale pollinator habitat corridors from coast to coast. We do this by selecting and subsequently funding grant recipients to develop native wildflower seed mixes that are specific to their areas. So the call for applications for these grants go out each spring on Earth Day, actually. And this year, we selected seven recipients. In southern Ontario, planting in these four locations are going to mean that migration routes along lakes Huron, Erie, and Ontario will have new wildflower sites that will feed hungry insects and birds as they make their migration journeys every spring and fall. Over on the west coast, rare Gary Oak habitat, the habitat actually that the Taylor's Checker Spot butterfly calls home, will be enhanced in Helliwell Provincial Park, which is 
being done as a precursor to reintroductions of the Taylor's checker spot butterfly larvae that will be born in our conservation breeding program. And we're hopeful that in combination, these efforts will result in the butterfly flourishing in that park once again. Alberta will be benefiting from this seed grant program uh, next year with the renaturalization of a wildflower meadow in Bunchberry Meadows Conservation Area, which is a property just south of Edmonton, owned by the Nature Conservancy of Canada. And then finally, on the other side of Canada, uh, the seventh wildflower site was chosen in an effort to restore agricultural land back into natural meadow that supports a unique um, coastal wildlife system in the Acadian forests of Nova Scotia. On the butterfly side of things, as I've already mentioned, in British Columbia, we have a breeding program for the Taylor's checker spot butterfly, which was a species that was thought to have been extirpated from Canada until a small population was found on Denman Island less than a decade ago. In addition to the breeding program, which now has seen successful releases uh, to augment wild populations since 2015, we're part of a larger recovery working group for the species. And part of that group is doing, uh, part of what that group is doing is dedicated toward creating and restoring that endangered Gary Oak ecosystem that I mentioned in the wildflower seed grants. And so that Gary Oak ecosystem now exists only in a narrow corridor along the coast of BC and the Pacific Coast Gulf Islands. So rehabilitating that ecosystem is really a critical part of preventing extinction of or extirpation from Canada of Taylor's checker swap butterfly. Here in Ontario, where I am, we are about a year into work on the recovery and reintroduction of the model dusky wing, which I will admit I consider a somewhat dull looking butterfly, but I'm obsessed with bees, so what do I know? Um, it's a butterfly that likes more open, sparsely vegetated areas where its host plants, New Jersey tea and prairie red, red root grow. Uh, it has only a few confirmed wild populations left here in Ontario, just east of Peterborough, there's one in a town called Marmara, and then in the Burlington and Oakville areas, there are a couple scattered populations. The first reintroductions for this species is, are, occur, are scheduled to occur in Pinery Provincial Park at the end of next summer, and that's in Grand Bend, Ontario, on the south shores of Lake Huron. All right, now the best part in my mind is our bumblebee program, which also fall under the Native Pollinator Initiative. Uh, right now we have well-established programs running in both Alberta and in Ontario, and these pri programs primarily focus on two specific bumblebee species at risk. The Western bumblebee, or Bombus occidentalis, out in Alberta, and the yellow bum banded bumblebee, Bombus terricola in Ontario, where its population is experiencing the most dramatic declines. But actually, the yellow banded bumblebee actually has a pretty extensive range in Canada, so we do get the opportunity to work with some of its healthier populations uh, out in Alberta, where we're surveying for the western bumblebee. So yes, our bumblebee species at risk program does target specific species, but our research really is meant to be broadly applicable to most bumblebee species in Canada. And we make an effort to explore the local fauna in lots of different types of habitats in the two provinces and abroad wherever we can. And all of our bumblebee work falls under what we call our bumblebee recovery program. And that is a program within the Native Pollinator Initiative and one that I'm going to talk about for the rest of the talk. As with the majority of well-established uh, research programs. This program has a number of different components. And then if I'm trying to best divide it, those are probably our citizen science, our education and outreach, our research and monitoring, and our conservation breeding programs. I'm going to touch a bit on all of them. But to start, a huge part of what we do involves continuously improving and expanding our citizen science programs. In Canada, there are over 40 species of bumblebees and tracking populations of all of these species is extremely time consuming. So like most organizations, one thing we struggle with is a limited personnel avail availability and funding availability. So what we do is we invest some of our resources into 
enhancing our ability to kind of harness the power and energy of volunteers so that we can supplement our own survey efforts um, through that volunteer participation. I'm sure you've all heard that the species specific records that citizen scientists collect can really help to increase the geographic reach and coverage of monitoring efforts for bumblebees and for lots of different species. And there's many examples of this like uh, iNaturalist or uh, Bumblebee Watch. But one thing I've learned in my time with WPC is that these programs actually also offer participants a pretty rare opportunity to have a valuable connection with nature. Uh, programs like these are not only a meaningful way for participants to connect to the natural world around them, but they also give them a sense that they're contributing to research and conservation in a valuable way. In my years with Wildlife Preservation Canada, I've actually had the pleasure of speaking pretty intimately with a few of our most dedicated volunteers, and some of the feedback I've received has been pretty eye-opening and quite heartwarming in some cases. Uh, this is a picture of Sarah on the right. Uh, she's our most dedicated and most involved volunteer in our longest standing citizen science program, which is at Pinery Provincial Park. And she wrote a blog for us actually back in December. And for any of you who are interested in kind of a bit of a behind the scenes look at the meanings of programs like this for some of its participants, I definitely urge you to check it out. It brought tears to my eyes the first time I read it, and I'm sure if I went back and read it again now, I would probably have the same reaction. And so Pinery Provincial Park is where our Bumblebee Survey Citizen Science Program was first established, and that was back in 2015. This park is the last known record of the endangered gypsy cuckoo bumblebee in Ontario, which was back in 2008. And it's the last known location of the Rusty Patch Bumblebee also in Canada, actually, not just Ontario. And that record was from 2009. So it's been over 10 years since either has been recorded in the province and over a decade since we've seen the Rusty Patch in Canada period. The program has continued to expand every year and we've added at least one new location with each successive year. Not only has our citizen science program rippled across Ontario from year to year, in 2017, we implemented a new program at Glenville Ranch Provincial Park, which is near Calgary, Alberta, actually just outside of a town called Cochrane. And this park is actually a really neat park for bumblebee research because it's one of the few remaining areas where the ranges of three of the four federally listed bumblebee species uh, overlap. So those are from left to right there, the yellow banded bumblebee, the western, and the gypsy cuckoo bumblebee. Our dedicated volunteers get better and better from year to year, and they do a fabulous job surveying for bumblebees. In the four years that we've run programs in Ontario, volunteers have recorded 12 species, four of which are either rare, like the lemon cuckoo here in green at the top and with the green X's, or are considered at risk like the other three, so the yellow bumblebee here in blue, the American in red, and the yellow banded in purple. These records of course depend on which programs are running in a given year because each species has a different range across the pro province, and while it is only 12 of Ontario's roughly 25 species, these records actually represent the majority of the species that are kind of within the range of these programs, um, so our participants are actually putting together pretty comprehensive survey results. The program at Glenbow Provincial, Glenbow Ranch Provincial Park rather, has now just finished its third year and after three years has collected volunteer survey records for 17 different species, two of which are federally listed species at risk, the western bumblebee um, in purple at the top here and the yellow banded in green. And one thing I will point out here is that 17 species sounds like more than 12, which of course it is more than 12, but actually bumblebees and a lot of insects are more diverse in Alberta than they are in Ontario, so you can't just uh, completely compare them neck and neck. 
Um, so beyond just expanding into new areas and working with new partners, our citizen science programs have actually continued to develop to address each area's own set of priorities. So a lot of them now include multiple components depending on what each area kind of is looking for. Some focus on identification workshops, others focus on extensive surveying efforts, and then we've had programs in the past, not in 2019, but as recently as 2018, that have had vol volunteers building, installing, and monitoring bumblebee nest boxes. And so what we found is that diversifying the kinds of programs that we offer has really allowed us to get the most out of them from a a research and conservation perspective and has also allowed us to keep our participants engaged and coming back to participate in new in initiatives from year to year. Aside from our structured citizen science initiatives, uh, we do spend a lot of time and resources on outreach and on educating people about pollinators, about the factors that threaten them, and then about some conservation initiatives that they can participate in. And this includes things like delivering presentations, setting up booths and displays, and doing hands-on interactive demonstrations at various types of events. In 2019, we have already participated in several outreach events with a lot of different organizations. And by doing so, we've engaged probably over 200 Ontarians of all ages uh, in pollinator education already. We've had professional and academic audiences participating at events with Ontario Parks and Wilfrid Laurier University. We've had audiences that have been full of retired naturalists at events um, like those with Plover, Plover Lovers, the TRCA and A. Rocha, Canada. And then we of course get families with children of all ages at all kinds of events. In Alberta, we've made an effort to increase our outreach and education in 2019, and we've par participated already in community events with a lot of new partners. We still have a few events scheduled, but have already engaged over almost 150 Albertans over there, and that's outside of our structured citizen science program. So we are definitely impacting the communities around the park where we're doing the bulk of our research. The third of the four components of our Bumblebee Recovery Program is our research and monitoring. And our aim has always been to really design a research program that addresses the knowledge gaps in our understanding of bumblebee biology and ecology. And so what we have is a research program that is a multifaceted approach that's dependent on collaboration between several organizations. And you'll see some of that collaboration going on as I go through the four primary uh, approaches that fall under this. So the first part of our research and monitoring initiative is distribution and abundance, which really boils down to our extensive bumblebee surveys every year. And the information that we get through these annual surveys is really what forms the framework that upon which we can build the rest of our research objectives. Um, in Ontario, we conduct extensive surveys every spring, and in those surveys, we're collecting information on the composition, the abundance, and the distribution of all of Ontario's bumblebees wherever uh, we find them. This is a map actually from last year's surveys because I haven't gotten around to making a new one yet for this year's data, but it still serves to show you what kind of ground we are covering from year to year. So this year we surveyed a total of 95 sites that are spread across three main regions, as you can see in the different color codes of that map. So we have a northern region that's centered around Thunder Bay, a central region near Sudbury, and a more southern region that's centered mostly around Guelph and Hamilton area. And despite the really cold, really late spring that we had this year, we collected 3,427 spring records for 17 different bumblebee species. 110 of those records were of four different species at risk, and five of the records were of three rare species. New this year, we've actually conducted some pretty extensive surveys in Glenbow Ranch Provincial Park over in Alberta. And this work is being done by, primarily by Tiffany, who is on the left here at the top. 
Um, and Tiffany has been part of our Bumblebee Pro Recovery Program now in some capacity for a couple of years, mostly in Ontario, but she is new to the program in Alberta this summer. So there we've selected three sampling sites in different habitats throughout the park. And Tiffany has now conducted eight morning and eight afternoon surveys in each of those three sites. She hasn't tallied her survey data yet, so I don't have any numbers to present to you, but I do know that two of the three federally listed species at risk thought to range there, the uh, yellow banded and the western, which I mentioned earlier, have already been recorded in each of the sites. And we're of course still after that elusive gypsy cuckoo bumblebee, which was found last year, which was recorded last year, uh, just outside of Calgary, so not far from the, the um, park. So maybe one day. So we've also coupled this, these uh, bumblebee surveys with some passive sampling for other pollinator species. And to do that, we're using vein traps, which you can see me bending over to grab in the bottom right there. Um, and by doing this kind of biomonitoring, we're working to build a better database of the pollinator species in the park, so beyond just the bumblebee species. The second primary avenue of our research and monitoring is our attempt at better understanding the nesting ecology of bumblebees. And we're doing that using artificial domiciles, which we actually call uh, bumblebee nest boxes. As one of Canada's few social bee groups, um, colony development in the bumblebee nest is a really important component of population dynamics overall, but not a lot is known about it. So bumblebee nests are really difficult to find in the wild, as you can imagine, even if you're a dog, not just for humans. So artificial nests are uh, like these ones, so ones that we build and we install, provide us with a rare opportunity to explore the different stages of colony development throughout the season as a whole. Um, these types of tools can might or might rather one day be useful in recovery strategies that require habitat enhancement, so where uh, nesting availability is a limiting resource, or for species reintroduction or even things like head starting. Um, so this, our work with nest boxes started at WPC in 2017 with former lead biologist Sarah Johnson, who's now at Simon Fraser University doing her PhD. And she worked with the Carter Lab, so with Ralph Carter at the University of Calgary to pilot a nest box study uh, over here in Ontario. And the study was then expanded in 2018 into a master's project that is ongoing and is led now by Haley Tompkins in Nigel Rain's lab at the University of Guelph. And then Sarah continued the uh, Bumblebee Nest Box project actually in Glenville Ranch Provincial Park last year, um, so in 2018. I wish I had time to go through some results of the nest box stuff with you because some of them are quite interesting and there's always a lot of great pictures. Um, but since time is kind of limited today, I'll just quickly introduce you to the nest boxes themselves. Um, they're painstakingly handmade out of plywood and they are usually installed either underground like you see at the top here and then buried uh, so that they're not very visible. Um, and underground is of course on a slope to, pr to ensure that they have appropriate drainage and they can also be attached to trees at four feet off the ground and they're always attached to deciduous trees in our studies. So they're deployed in the early days of spring before the bumblebee queens emerge from diapause or overwintering or hibernation, whatever you want to call it. And then they're monitored regularly throughout the season for signs of occupation. When there is occupation, it can be incredibly neat to watch. As I said, watching the colonies grow is something that most bumblebee researchers don't get to witness um, in their careers, unless they're with commercial colonies. And it's really neat to get an opportunity to see how the different species act and interact in and near their nest sites. So these are just some great pictures of some bumblebees inside their nests. The third avenue I'll touch on is that of pollen networks and phenology. And this is a multi-year collaboration with Scott McIver's lab at the University of Toronto Scarborough that began actually back in 2017. 
So during spring surveys across Ontario, pollen samples are collected from the corbicular loads, which is just the hind leg of foraging bumblebee queens. And the samples are mounted to slides so that the pollen grains can be identified to at least genus level. And then we can begin to build pollen networks from those identifications to, so, to show which species are eating what and at what times in the spring. Information that this kind of research gets us not only helps us better understand niche partitioning and competition within the systems that we're uh, sampling in, but uh, also exploring the phenology of each species in a system can actually help us track or detect species declines or even ecological shifts. And both of these can be precursors to population level changes. So work like this actually becomes super important when we're trying to predict how climate change might be affecting different species in different parts of the province. And then the last research avenue, yes, the last research avenue we'll touch on quickly is that that explores habitat preferences for species at risk. Um, we, I'm sure all hear often that creating pollinator friendly habitat is one of the ways we can mitigate pollinator declines from habitat loss, uh, pathogen spillover and climate change. But these habitat requirements for bumblebees are really not actually very well known. And so a lot of habitat stewardship initiatives are actually done somewhat blindly or at least assumptively and certainly so uh, for certain bumblebee species. So to tackle this knowledge gap, in 2017, we partnered with the Sheila's, Sheila Cola's lab at York University, and we started to develop a targeted research program in Ontario. So PhD student Amanda Lixner has now done habitat assessments at 25 sites where the yellow-banded bumblebee and or the American bumblebee, which are two uh, species at risk in Ontario, have been recently recorded. And in her habitat assessment, she has qualified and quantified the local and landscape level habitat variables that are best supporting each of these bumblebee species at risk. And then new this year, since we have an opportunity to, or we had an opportunity to expand our research in Alberta, um, we've actually complemented this research and in three sites in Glenville Ranch Provincial Park, we've done these habitat assessments at two times in the season, once in the height of the foraging or the bumblebee foraging season, so when all of the um, summer flowers are blooming and bumblebee abundance is usually highest for most species. And we're, and Tiffany is just in the final stages of doing the second round uh, when the second generation queens, so the queens that are faced with having to overwinter and start a new colony in the spring, now's the time that they're looking for sites where they can overwinter and survive our harsh climates. So having an idea of what the habitats look like at two different time periods is definitely going to give us more information on um, how these habitats are supporting the different species. And so the last thing that I have time to kind of chat a bit about today is our conservation breeding program. And I know I said a lot already, so I will keep it as brief as I possibly can, even though like the research and monitoring, it has multiple components to it too. Um, the ultimate goal of this program is to refine current bumblebee techniques so that, or bumblebee breeding techniques rather, so that they can be applied to species at risk. And that's because we want to be able to create programs that can be used to help augment declining populations and reintroduce species to restored habitats where they were once common. But as I'm sure you can all imagine, conservation breeding for invertebrates is very rare. And there are a number of challenges to overcome in developing reliable techniques for breeding and rearing. And these challenges are even tougher when the program is being specifically designed for sensitive species. They are notoriously difficult to rear in the lab, so they just make things harder. Um, that said, we do work with the yellow-banded bumblebee, which is a species listed as of special concern uh, in Canada, but we also use other more common species so that we don't perpetuate the decline of wild populations of, this, of the yellow-banded bumblebee, and also because these other species can sometimes actually lead us to answers or to techniques we might not have thought of without them. 
And so our program now currently works with three other bee species, two of which are bumblebee species, the brown belted and the common eastern bumblebee, and one non-bumblebee species, the honeybee. Our breeding program in 2018 and 2019 was split between two partner facilities, one at the African Lion Safari, where John Spiro leads the husbandry of the bees there, and one at the Toronto Zoo, where uh, the bees are well kept by Lydia Attard. And in these and so these facilities are in charge for caring for the bees using the husbandry protocols that we've kind of developed over the years at WPC. Every year we make an effort to use the previous years as results to, uh, and actually couple that with expert documentation and advice from major breeding facilities across North America. And so we put all that together to tweak our husbandry protocols in hopes that we can get rid of any of the factors that might be negatively affecting colony pr um, production or propagation of the species in uh, the facilities. <clears throat> Sorry. And so this year we added the brown belted bumblebee, as I mentioned, to the captive population. And that was in an effort to help us tease apart what specific requirements species at risk need that other more common hardy species like the brown belted bumblebee can do without. And teasing apart husbandry protocols is a finicky thing in most captive breeding programs, as I mentioned. It really requires that you think about every biotic and abiotic factor that the bees are exposed to or might be exposed to at some point. So for example, these are things like what ingredients we include in our sugar solution and why. What method we use to feed that nectar solution to the bees and why. And how we can prevent contamination in that nectar, both in, um, so within a single colony and across colonies in each facility. Um, just this past winter, we ran our first ever large-scale overwintering trials, um, and for them we used 158 gynes, which are second-generation queens, um, from four commercial colonies of the common eastern bumblebee. Uh, this work was largely conducted by Liam, who you can see in the bottom right here, who, like Tiffany, has been very instrumental in the completion of various bumblebee projects with WPC now for several years. Uh, he also led this year's spring surveys in the southern Ontario region. And so with these overwintering trials, what we wanted to do was to figure out what, what actually helps a bumblebee queen survive long periods of diapause, like our Canadian winters. So some of them have to survive upwards of eight months. And so how are they doing this? Um, figuring this out is not only important from a breeding program perspective, because we want to get of course, to a point where our program is productive enough that we don't ever need to collect wild queens. But it will also help us to explore how they're surviving in the winter in wild systems. And that's something that's going to inevitably, inevitably have to be part of any Canadian species at risk uh, bumblebee recovery strategy. So these pilot trials, what we did um, was we examined the relationship between the bee's body weight going into diapause and the length of time that it actually survived in that overwintering chamber. We had a number of variables. One was temperature. So we had two different temperatures for diapause, one at four degrees Celsius and the other at seven. We also varied the number of days that we allowed the queens to forage before they were put, so forage being eat, before they were put in an overwintering chamber. So it was either zero, so they were pulled and put directly into diapause, five days or 10 days. And then the last one was whether or not the queen was foraging alone or she was um, housed with her sisters, as you can see in the bottom there, um, to forage for however many days she was prescribed to. And then so in the overwintering chambers, they're just kept in these little um, organic cardboard boxes that you can see in the bottom right. 
The third little bit I'll introduce you to are our recent efforts to introduce a non-aggressive technique of promoting broodiness or egg laying or colony um, establishment in our bumblebee queens. So large-scale bumblebee rearing facilities actually use aggressive installation techniques to promote colony development. And the two most common techniques now are either a daily regimen of aggressive CO2 narcosis or pairing queens together and in the same um, house and forcing them to fight to the death. Obviously, we aren't particularly interested in using either of these techniques for a program geared toward the recovery of a species at risk. So instead, in 2018, we began trialing the introduction of honeybees as a method to encourage broodiness in our bumblebee queens. And so similar work has actually been done by other researchers where the brood of workers from other bumblebee colonies are introduced to a queen who um, has not started, has not initiated a colony yet, but the technique has hardly been documented using bum bumblebees or sorry, honeybees rather than bumblebees. And so what we did was we added callow, which means they're very newly emerged, um, specifically in our case, less than 24 hours old. So the workers haven't imprinted yet on a queen. And so we add these callow honeybees to the enclosures of yellow banded bumblebee queens. And actually in all cases where we did that, we didn't observe any major aggression in um, either of the two species and the honeybee workers quickly kind of just began following the, the bumblebee queen and helped where there was help to be had. And so we're still in the early stages of this work, but so far it seems like it might be a promising technique, at least for our purposes. Uh, and we're lucky to have a chance to continue trialing um, the technique with our relationship with the Zayed lab at York University. Um, we can easily source callow honeybees through them, which is not, otherwise not necessarily an easy thing to do unless you have your own uh, colonies. And so the very last component I'm gonna chat about of our conservation breeding program is another new addition in the 2018-2019 season, so very recently. And that is um, exploring pathogens and parasites in our wild-caught yellow-banded bumblebee queens. And so for this, we've been working with Kirsten Palmier from the University of Regina. Uh, she's a master's student there. Um, and she's dissected all of our 2018 queens to look for these pathogens. And the protocol for this was actually developed by uh, one of our colleagues from the USDA in Logan, Utah, Jamie Strange and um, Amber Tripodi. And the ones we're actually really looking for are pathogen par and parasites that either kill the bee or they negatively affect their reproductive potential. So those are two really important things um, when you are trying to develop a successful captive breeding program. And so the ones specifically that we're targeting are some of the more common pathog bumblebee pathogens in those groups. And those are things such as uh, microsporidia, like Nosema there at the top, or neogregorines like apocystis. And those are pathogens usually found in the fat body of the bumblebee. And so these pathogens infect the queen when she's overwintering and feeds off of her fat stores. So those queens don't usually survive until spring. And so <clears throat> if we're gonna have um, a system where we have overwintering queens, we need to make sure that they are not ridden with apocystis pathogens. And then the last one there is a species of tripos, trypanosomatid, um, and that, in product, that impacts reproductive success because it affects ovarian development in the bumblebee queens. Um, so we have found a few pathogens in our 2018 queens, but we actually did our dissections a little bit late, and so a lot of our bumblebees had desiccated beyond what we could kind of use to do these um, um, analyses visually. So instead, what we're doing is we've kept samples of the gut contents of all of these queens, and we'll do some genetic sequencing on those samples uh, in tandem or in collaboration with Amy Shabbat, who is both 
with the African Lion Safari and with Queen's University. And then this fall, we'll also be doing the same analyses. So the dissections like Kirsten did and the genetic component of those dissections for all of our 2019 captive um, queens. And so that's the bumblebee recovery program in a teeny tiny nutshell. Uh, but the research and the work really does go on and on and on and on and on. And that's starting with Bombus 2.0, um, which Wildlife Preservation Canada is co-hosting actually with York University this October. So this is gonna be a meeting to explore next steps in bumblebee research and conservation in North America. And it has bumblebee researchers from across Canada, the US and from Mexico and the UK who will be leading workshops that are designed to outline um, the gaps in our current understanding of bumblebee biology and ecology and kind of have discussions to reevaluate the status of North America's 46 bumblebee species and reprioritize um, research efforts moving forward. So if you or anyone you know should be there, please get yourself or them registered. The deadline is coming up. It is next Friday, September 27th, and you can find more information about it and can register online at uh, the website there, wildlifepreservation.ca slash bombus with two S's. And with that, I am done and I'll end it here with a huge thank you for listening. I know it was a lot of information and I did try my best to keep it brief, but I realize I think it's been a bit longer than some of you might have been anticipating. So I'm happy to stay for questions if anyone has any, or you're welcome to connect with me via email when it's convenient for you. Oh, thank you so much, Genevieve. That was really, really interesting. Uh, we have a few different options if you want to ask questions. So you can type them in the group chat or you can unmute yourself. There's a little mic uh, and you should be able to just press it and it will unmute and you can ask your question to her. Um, I'll start off by asking a question. Uh, for the citizen science projects, um, if you don't have your phone with you and you can't take a picture for iNaturalist, is there any resources like a book or a website that can help you identify bee species? Yeah, so actually, good question. We don't use iNaturalist in our citizen science programs. We actually use Bumblebee Watch, which is a very cool um, North America-wide bumblebee citizen science um, platform. It works much the same as iNaturalist, only the difference is that we actually have a panel of experts who verify all of the submissions. So when you when a user submits a photo of a bumblebee they have an opportunity to identify it themselves using the resources that are embedded in the platform but then somebody goes through and verifies them at the end of the year and so we get this massive database that we can use to help us with these uh, species status assessments for all of our north american bumblebees that's pretty cool. And then, of course, in our programs, we have lots of outreach material that we give to all of our participants. And that includes um, almost always a small identification card for identifying the most common species in that area. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, does anyone else have any questions? Wait a minute. I know uh, Zoom is a bit different. It might be hard for... <laughs> we'll just wait a second. Uh, this is Shelley. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. It's, uh, I knew a little bit about wildlife preservation, but oh my, you're just all over the country and uh, so many different researchers. I mean, you're really on the pulse of what's going on with bumblebees. Yeah. Well, congratulations on, on what you're doing. Um, just a, a question. So, I mean, we, you know, we, we often give, uh, we try to engage our, our bee cities of what they can do and certainly about habitat. So uh, are there things that, you know, that perhaps you, you would recommend for, for, for cities um, in particular in their, in their gardens, in their wild spaces? So that's, that's a tough question to answer. Um, usually when people ask me how they can help, my response kind of becomes, you know, choose something that you think you can do long term. So whether that's really uh, interactive and participating in hands on in a citizen science program, whether it's donating to charities who are doing the work for you, or even just 
gardening because that's what you like to do. The problem with recommending just one flower species or even a handful is that for pollinator health, you really need to have a healthy growing season from start to finish. And so what that means is that you have floral resources that are available from the onset of spring all the way to the end of fall, so that you're not just inviting species in at one time when something delicious is blooming, and then once that bloom senesces, there's nothing for them to eat, and they so I think what's important to consider whenever you're gardening is to always have something in bloom, to have a diversity of things blooming so that you're appealing to more species. So different shapes, different colors, and different sizes of plants. And then, of course, try to stay as native as possible. Thank you. All right. Uh, we don't have any other questions unless someone wants to speak up. Well, I have a question about, you know, how do we, um, I mean, clearly there's a lot of bumblebee species that are at risk, uh, you know, some at risk of extinction and their, and their numbers are declining. And I think um, that seems to be the information uh, that's getting out there. And, and so what about, what would you suggest for, um, I mean, this is a tough question, but you know, for politicians that somehow make decisions um, based on, you know, pesticide use or, or farming practices or, or, or even um, conservation areas and maybe what they're spraying as well. Because I imagine there's impacts from everything. And so is, is, there a, is there something you could suggest of how we could engage more politicians? Do you think that would be helpful? Of course it would be helpful in terms of how to engage them. I'm not sure I know the answer to that and I'm not sure that there's one kind of single remedy to the problem, uh, but I think just spreading information and spreading education to more people is really what gets people and communities rallied together on a certain um, topic, whether it's pollinator health or um, indigenous rights. It doesn't matter what it is, the more people you have involved, the louder the message becomes. And so I think having these types of things, this goes back to my whole idea at the beginning, that having these types of webinar series where we can share information and create new partnerships and new networks is really what will ultimately help us to um, increase knowledge across the country. But there is no easy remedy and I do not um, ever wish to be a politician who has to make such de decisions. Thank you. It's a good answer. <laughs> All right. I saw someone, a few people unmuted uh, their mics. Does anybody else have any questions? No, nope, maybe not. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, is there anything else you wanted to add, Genevieve, before we get going? Thank you again. That's all. Yeah, no, thank you. Wow, that was so interesting. I did not know that there was that much research going into it. That's amazing. Yeah. So do we, did we find out what's your favorite bumblebee? Yeah. Oh, I like them all. I can't. Whichever one lets me pet them the longest. <laughs> <laughs> so what have you learned uh, in the last, uh, I don't know, in the last little while that sort of surprised you about their behavior or about their intelligence that maybe people don't know? Actually, one of the things that I found coolest when I first got really into um, doing bumblebee surveys specifically, because prior to working with Wildlife Preservation Canada, I actually was not really into bumblebees. I was more into other native pollinators in Canada. And so in doing the bumblebee surveys, I started noticing that a lot of the species have their own smell. And so that's kind of common knowledge when it comes to honeybees, some of the pheromones that they expel when they're uh, scared or when they're trying to warn others in their colony, it smells like bananas to us. But there are a couple species in Ontario of bumblebee that smell like rotten cheese or like acetone. And so even before I look at the bumblebee in the vial, I know exactly what it is based on the smell. That was something I never knew. And you can't really know until you're out in the field doing it. Interesting. And just a question about, because they're also live in colonies like the honeybee, are there any other similarities? Do you think there's some communication that goes on in, in ways? Oh, absolutely. They communicate a lot. And that was kind of one of the um, 
things that I was alluding to when I was talking about the nest boxes is that having an opportunity to look at these colonies during development um, in the wild gives us a chance to see how they're interacting with each other. And we also get that opportunity to in the um, captive breeding setting. But they're always discussing things with each other, whether it be through touch or through scent. Mm -hmm. Do they groom each other too? Do they, uh, do they, uh, well, they said they, they, I guess they, they must have their antennas all over each other or yeah. different ways that they communicate. Yeah, for sure. Antenna are big, big organs in uh, bee and a lot of insect uh, communication. So they always keep those clean. Mm -hmm. well, did not, did not know the fact about how they all smell differently. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, and we will put this on YouTube um, if anyone wants to watch it again or the Wildlife Pres Preservation Canada wants to share it. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, and I think we're good, unless you have anything else to say, Genevieve. No, I'm great. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you again. Talk to you later. <laughs> Bye.